but the most important thing you apply compressive strain like 1.7 1, percent and that forces the top layer to be c oriented i don't know you know it's relatively it's, it's the films we're looking at they're half micron and so i don't think that 40 angstroms at the bottom will affect the half a micron film significantly well it's it's, it's an equilibrium phase okay. right so the only difference is that when you put it on sto right you're squeezing it and it's trying to get that so it's it's a skinny and tall but then you have depolarizing fields and so at some point at about 350 angstroms it says I don't want to do that anymore. I want to go this way. And there is a small transition area. And then at the top, it's all like this. And But then you have, of course, you know, it's, it's a square lattice and you're putting a tetragonal thing on it. So you can go this way or that way. And so there is 50-50 chance. So you have 50% of one type and you see it in the XRD. You see that you have two orientations. And then, of course, each one of them can split into ferroelectric domains. So in principle, you have like four ferroelectric configurations in the top film. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, I want to thank the uh, organizing committee for letting me talk, the rest of the organizing committee. So, so uh, I spoke about this subject uh, quite a few years ago at, at one of these uh, workshops and uh, kind of put it on the back burner. And uh, over the years, uh, I come back to it occasionally with different uh, people working with me and finally figured it out just recently. So uh, so I'm really excited about this. And actually, there's some kind of general conclusions one can make, and it really won't take that long to explain this. Um, so I'm at the Carnegie Institution. Uh, we're a private research lab. And this work was done in collaboration with uh, Mukhtar uh, Ahart and uh, Russ Hemley, who are now at the... Uh, uh, University of Illinois in Chicago. So, uh oh, this worked when I tried it before. And of course, it doesn't work now. Okay, not sure why this doesn't. Maybe you can look at that. I don't know why it doesn't work. Okay, so anyway, so uh, 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 lead titanate is, uh, of course, one of the most classic uh, ferroelectrics. And it was thought for a long time that ferroelectricity should be squeezed out by high pressure. And this really makes a lot of intuitive sense because if you think of kind of rattling ions like Slater's uh, idea from 1950, then as you go up in pressure, there's no room for ions to rattle anymore. And so ferroelectricity should go away with pressure. And in fact, that was what was seen in uh, experiments just like what was expected. So this was published in 1983, but uh, but this is uh, Raman uh, versus pressure. And at 12 GPA, the Raman modes uh, went to zero frequency. And above that, no uh, clear Raman signal was seen. And so, uh, so it was consistent with ferroelectricity going away with pressure. And, and, and there was a long uh, idea uh, still held by many people that crystal structures should get simpler as you go up in pressure. Because if you think of like hard spheres or something, they should try to get packed closer and closer together and close packing has high symmetry. And so, uh, so things should get simple with pressure. But we've been finding uh, all over uh, the periodic table and different crystal structures that, it, that that's not necessarily true. I mean, even something like an element like sodium, it turns out that high pressure it, it structure gets much more complicated at the low pressure. But I'm not gonna dwell on that today, but that was the idea and that made a lot of sense. But then there was this, uh, oh, oh, wait. Okay, yeah, I wanted to say this uh, just very briefly. You know, the classic uh, materials, I don't think I need to, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but classic materials like lead titanate or baritonate, there's just a wealth of new things to learn about them in spite of them being kind of the sodium chloride of ferroelectricity. So so uh, 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 I don't want to dwell on that, but... Uh, 
let me just go ahead to the main uh, topic here. So there was this work by Kornev and Belage, um, and uh, this was uh, some years ago. So this is 2005. So uh, so uh, you know we're it's almost 10 years ago. So so um, and what they found in their uh, DFT calculations was that. Uh, that uh, they found the ferroelectricity uh, reentrant and coming back in barium titanate and lead titanate with pressure. And, um, and so that was really exciting. And so uh, my colleagues and I decided we should do some experiments and just uh, see that, you know, confirming the DFT. I mean, I'm a DFT person, so of course I believed it, you know. So we uh, set up a, a, a second harmonic generation system and got some good samples of uh, lead titanate and uh, and did the the measurements versus pressure and uh, and these uh, summarize uh, many experiments uh, both single crystal and powder room temperature and 10 kelvin and what happens is the second harmonic uh, generation signal goes to zero at about uh, 10 gpa or so uh, can completely consistent with the 1980 uh, raman experiments and then just remains uh, measurably zero up to 100 GPA. So not consistent with the, the DFT uh, calculations. And, um, and we tried everything with the experiments and there was just no way to measure any signal. Now, the second harmonic signal should be show you if something is polar or not. And if it's really polar, we should see a good signal. We see a very strong signal at zero pressure and then it goes away. So, um, so what's going? So this is done, by the way, in situ in, in a diamond anvil cell. So so uh, so after that, there was a long uh, period of uh, you know heartfelt contemplation and uh, DFT calculations of all sorts. And some of the people in this room are were uh, uh, worked on, uh, unfortunately, uh, on this and never uh, published anything because couldn't figure out what was going on. So anyway, I came back to this uh, uh, relatively recently, and uh, uh, what we uh, did was uh, some really, really careful uh, uh, pseudopotential calculations, but comparing, making new pseudopotentials and making sure they agreed with all electron LEPW with the ALK code. And so it turned out that, you know, these are small, relatively small energy differences, and we finally nailed it down. So I can very briefly just say what I think is the right answer. So, so we indeed find that tetragonal uh, uh, lead titanate at, uh, up to like 10 uh, GPA, but then it becomes uh, our uh, bar 3C, which is centrosymmetric and there should be no signal. And it's, 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 uh, it's a first order phase transition. Uh, so so uh, it's not a soft mode transition, but, but the, uh, but the uh, instability of the tetragonal phase looks like a soft mode transition. So that's kind of interesting in itself. But you can see from the pile up of, of, uh, of uh, enthalpies up here, how close in energy or an enthalpy all of these different phases are. My, yeah, okay, you can see this. So in this region, you can see that all these different phases are almost the same enthalpy. So it's really, you know, millivolt kind of uh, accuracy you need per atom to get uh, the right phase there, I think. Oops. And uh, then at uh, like 35 GPA, we find another centrosymmetric structure, tetragonal I R I4MCM. So both of these are zone boundary instability. So first there's a zone instability, boundary instability at the R point, then at the M point that, that dominates. And then it goes back to the R point again. So this is a 10 point uh, atom unit cell. But the interesting thing is, so at 85 GPA, we're finding it to be ferroelectric again. So, so we can't really say that uh, Kornoff and Belaish were wrong. They were just uh, even, uh, you know, eventually it did become ferroelectric. So what's going on here uh, is, and this is what I've been sitting on for some months uh, uh, until I finally just came to grips with it. But but uh, so if you look at the polarization, you can see it drops uh, and then goes to zero. Then it comes up again and looks quite uh, ferroelectric. So that doesn't seem consistent with the experiments. And that's why I've kind of sat on this for a little while. But I, I, I think that, uh, that this is just, uh, since it's a first order phase transition going from uh, the tetragonal to the rhombohedral phase, I think that just 
metastably, the tetragonal phase is just remaining in the experiments. At the very top end of the measurements, and most of the measurements were done at lower pressures. So I, I'm trying to get my experimental colleagues to look again at higher pressures. Oh, and just to point out uh, the comparison with elk, I mean, uh, when we look at the, uh, these are like um, uh, comparing uh, uh, enthalpy curves or energy and enthalpy with elk and the pseudopotentials, and they really agree quite well. So again, this is that high, high pressure for electric phase, looking at the enthalpy, and uh, they're really quite close. Uh, uh, they finally have some small differences, but basically they're this perfect green mode. Of course, the advantage of the pseudopotentials is we can optimize the structures and everything, and we have analytic uh, stresses and forces that are quite accurate, we, accurate, which is not the case in LAPW. And then this is the last thing I want to uh, say, and then I'll end, is, is, uh, is um, and uh, take some uh, questions or discussion, is uh, I also wanted to see if we could compute what the uh, uh, second harmonic uh, signal should look like. I had some hopes that it would be weak at a megabar, and that was why they didn't see it at the experiment, but it was not the case. So this shows the uh, computed second harmonic uh, signal, and uh, it does seem like it should come back, though it is somewhat orientation dependent. So if one had a sample that had preferred orientation, maybe the signal is relatively weak. Uh, but if you have really a powder, you should see something, I think, uh, above 80 GPA. So uh, this was done with the alt code, and uh, I think it's uh, nice to be able to do these nonlinear optic uh, uh, computations as well. Oh, and then the last issue, uh, just uh, last couple minutes, is what drives this ultra high pressure ferroelectricity? And uh, now what uh, uh, Kornev and Belay had said, which I really didn't uh, uh, buy, but I can say that because I'm going to tell you in a minute that the only thing I could find is what they mentioned, is uh, they, they suggested that participation of the oxygen 2S states becomes important at really high pressures. And um, so uh, I'm still not that comfortable with that, but let me show you first. Th this is at 150 GPA, so well into the region of to the ferroelectric stability. If you look at the band structures for the uh, centrosymmetric uh, phase, and the ferroelectric phase, but looking at the same line, so we're not gonna show you different band structure because of the different symmetry, but it's looking at the same K points. Uh, then, uh, and then uh, coloring the, 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 the lines according to the amount of uh, titanium D uh, character, you really can't see anything different with the I. I mean, they really look identical. And uh, so the electronic structure really looks the same in the ferroelectric phase and the, and the centrosymmetric phase. But if you look at some of the numbers, <laughs> the only thing that stands out is the, uh, is the oxygen 2S character in the ferroelectric phase versus the centrosymmetric phase. And since the bands are basically the same, I think it just must mean that the that the O2S states are, are, are more diffuse in the, in the uh, in and in, uh, in the um, um, in the ferroelectric phase than they are in the uh, in the uh, centrosymmetric phase. So uh, I just want to wrap this up. Uh, when really small, you know, in ferroelectrics, one of the curses of ferroelectrics is also uh, well, one of the good things about ferroelectrics is that they're so sensitive to everything, and that's why we're here. And then the, one of the curses of ferroelectrics is that means that the energy scale is really, really small. So you have to worry about that. Um, um, and, uh, and I think this is, is, again, goes back to the beginning that you have this very delicate cancellation of long range and so short range forces. And so, you know, just very small changes in how you treat things can change uh, phase stability. Uh, and I, I want to push it, and, I, and again, this is preaching to the choir too, but you know, having experimentalists involved is really important because if we had just done the theory, we would have just accepted, okay, there's high pressure for electricity, you know, and moved on from there. But by getting someone to actually do the experiments, we find things that are more interesting than that. Um, so I will uh, take questions at that point. Thanks. Uh, 
So they've been down at room temperature and then at, at, at uh, 10 Kelvin. Okay, so you don't believe that the temperature might play your own get into the room? No, because I mean, at least uh, that, that figure I showed of the SHG results contains both room temperature and 10 Kelvin results. So, so we, it, it seems like it's not. I mean, that's what we hoped, of course, is, oh, it's just, that you know, a difference between room temperature. And so I, you know, my poor colleagues, you know, every time they come to me with a result, I say, oh, now you've got to do it at helium temperatures. You know, I mean, uh, you know, so they, I never believe them because it disagrees with our theory, right? But in the end, I have to say there, you know, it seems right. It's at maybe at the highest range of their... Okay, maybe one more question for your indoor videos. Yes. Is a function pressure. Were you able to double check at least some of the points with all electrons? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's one one of the slides I showed was direct comparison of LEPW all electron full potential, you know, and you know with the same exchange correlation potential, and uh, comparing with the pseudo potential. Okay, and last very quick question from your experience. At which pressure the standard pseudo potential stop working? Ah, well, that seems to be pretty low because uh, if you look at the, um, uh, I won't show the slide. I'll let. Oh, uh, do we? Yeah, whoever has the next talk, you can go ahead and put your slides up. Uh, you can go ahead and pull up the next slides, and even stop recording. So, so, so. Um, <clears throat> 